Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, friends and colleagues from across the world. Uh, welcome to our first pod in our session with uh, a special guest from England, Dr. Paul Tipton. Welcome to our uh, pod in our session today. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. So, what is a pod in our, um, my friends? We are uh, doing about a half and half uh, a podcast format as well as webinar format so our viewers can get a closer connection with our speakers and their topics and their backgrounds and where they have come from and who, where, and uh, most importantly, why. And uh, today uh, we will be discussing a very, very hot topic um, that uh, most of you encounter in your clinical practice with an expert in the field, um, Dr. Tipton. Uh, before we go into um, getting a little bit uh, to know Dr. Tipton, let's uh, have a quick um, review of his credentials. He's a highly respected specialist in prosthodontics across the world. Dr. Paul has published over 100 scientific articles in the dental press and is an expert lecturer in this field with Tipton Training Academics in Manchester, London, where he resides, and in Dubai. It's uh, www.tiptontraining.co.uk. After gaining his master's degree in conservative dentistry in 1989, he was awarded a diploma in general dental practice by the Royal College of Surgeons. Four years later, and received specialty status in prosthodontics in 1999 from the GDC. He is currently a professor of cosmetic dentistry at the City of London Dental School and BPP University and President of the British Academy of Restorative Dentistry, www.bard.uk.com. An ex-professional cr cricketer with Lanshire Country Cricket Club, he's one of the most successful dentists in the UK, and you can visit his uh, personal website at drpaultipton.com, where he has specialty clinics in Manchester and London, tclinic.co that UK and regularly appears in dentistry top 50 UK dentist poll. Wow, you are everything that is uh, uh, that uh, that's British, Dr. Paul Tipton. <laughs> uh, very you. exciting to have you. So, Dr. Tipton, over 100 publications uh, since 1890, uh, 1889. <laughs> 1989. I'm not that old. You're certainly not that old. What has been the motivation? What were the the core focus on your on your research in your career? Um, my motivation, I think, has been to uh, excellence. I suppose, I suppose that's it, excellence. So I've always striven for excellence uh, since doing my master's degree. Um, I was lucky to come into contact with some excellent teachers and trainers when I was doing my master's degree at the Eastman in London. Uh, and I got the bug, I suppose, at that stage for teaching and for just trying to be as good as I could possibly be. So the motivation has been to be as good as I can be. That's wonderful. We can never, uh, we can never um, reach perfection, but we can uh, right. get close to it uh, by working with others and uh, and uh, uh, bringing that to to the forefront. So your research was mostly in cosmetic dentistry, uh, uh, materials. Uh, Mo mostly restorative dentistry. Mostly restorative dentistry. Yeah. So in the years, in the last uh, um, few decades, uh, a lot of things have changed. Uh, you've seen a lot of people come and go. Yes, what is your absolutely. prediction of the future? Oh, gosh. Who could have predicted where we'd be now? Uh, I think a lot of people would have lost a lot of money if they'd be predicting the future. So <laughs> I've, got, I've got no crystal ball. I have no idea. This has thrown a complete spanner in the works. So goodness knows where we're going to be in three months' time. In 12 months time no idea so in your time it was more of a single practice one-on-one -on -one. have uh, in in our country now in the u.s uh, it has changed quite a bit to a lot of corporations coming into our industry uh, is that happening in uh in uh in europe yeah, as well yeah. uh certainly in the uk about uh 30 percent i think it's 25 percent maybe uh of practices are owned by corporates now uh and that is coming in more and more and more uh, and uh, less and less is it the single-handed practitioner. It's a shame. It's very shameful, and uh, and there are some things done in the U.S. to prevent that expansion because it, no, really. no matter how you weigh, weigh you put it and how you describe it, 
at the end of the day, there's a third party that's unlicensed that's interfering with the patient-doctor relationship. Mm -hmm. That's Absolutely. essentially what it boils down to. Because no matter how you structure it, material selection, uh, uh, your staff selection, your hour selection, your uh, the way you want to conduct your business, it all trickles down to what happens chair side. And uh, you have this problem where uh, under the guise of management, we have a lot of interferences with that now. Very good. So, yeah. so tell us about your hobbies, uh, uh, cricketeer. You had a quite a bit of a so, career. Yeah. I was uh, uh, going back many, many years ago. I used to play for uh, England under 19s at cricket. So my passion uh, before dentistry has always been cricket, sport generally, but but cricket. Cricket is I won't say our national game because soccer, football is our national game. Uh, cricket's our second. Uh, national game the national game during the summertime during the uh, if you can believe it when England have some good weather um, so that's when we play cricket um, been my passion uh, I was lucky enough to be um, good enough at it to be paid to do it so for several years I was paid to be a professional for Lancashire uh, County Cricket Club that was after I'd uh, been playing for England under 19s and during that time, I also decided that uh, I needed to get myself qualified. So sort of halfway through that time of playing professional cricket, I also went to, to university and got myself uh, qualified as a dentist. Wow. And uh, how long have you been a professor for, doctor? Uh, that's seven years. Seven years. Do you find that uh, the educational side of the profession rewarding? Very, very much so. I tried to... Uh, still keep my business so that I do roughly 50% clinical work and 50% teaching. Um, it's more and more difficult because I get asked an awful lot more to do the teaching side. But I do try to keep a lid on it, try to keep it so it stays at 50-50 roughly. Um, there'll be times during the week or one week where I might do uh, five, six days um, teaching, no clinical work. And then the next week, maybe five clinical days. And it's up and down. But over a period of a year, it stays at about that 50-50. 50-50, wow. So you're bringing a topic to the table that a lot of us can uh, can relate to, which is the Warren dentition. Yeah. Uh, a lot of my colleagues don't have the experience uh, or, or knowledge about occlusion, and we restore things, and then they fall apart, and then we restore them again, and then it becomes a issue of uh, contention with the patient, and uh, things start trickling down into a negative direction. Um, yeah. What would you say to someone that uh, encounters this problem and uh, doesn't necessarily uh, doesn't have the skills or knowledge to, to properly restore patients to function? Um, I think that the, the basic thing, and I don't know what it's like in other countries, I can only speak for the areas that I go into regularly. So, so I obviously teach a lot in the UK. I teach a lot in the Middle East. We have an academy out in Dubai. So I spend probably one week in every four to six weeks in Dubai or Kuwait uh, or the Middle East somewhere teaching. So I understand what is going on there with the undergraduate teaching and what's going on with the UK undergraduate teaching. And occlusion's just hardly mentioned. And for me, occlusion is the biggest topic in dentistry. If you don't understand occlusion, you know, I'm quite forthright with my views. You can't be a dentist. All you are, if you don't understand occlusion, is basically a tooth filler, because to understand occlusion is to understand the masticatory system, and that's what we should be doing, and that falls through into every different part of dentistry, whether it's prosthodontics, cosmetic work, uh, your perio is going to fail if the occlusion's wrong, uh, the endo won't settle down if the occlusion's wrong, your orthodontics won't be stable if the occlusion's wrong. So it all comes down to the undergraduate training. And I feel very, very sorry for so many um, young dentists now who are qualifying who just do not get, do not understand occlusion. And my advice, going back to your question, my advice is to, to take time out, as now we're being forced to, and go backwards and start to learn occlusion. Because that will then benefit everybody. Everybody will be able to go again with then a much deeper knowledge of why things work and why things fail. Uh, and the, the key thing for everything in dentistry, as I'm sure you'll, you'll understand and agree with, is predictability. We need to be able to look at the patient or look at a treatment that we're doing 
and be able to say this will work predictably not it will work in you but i don't know why it doesn't work in you perhaps you've got a strong bite and therefore it doesn't work that's not predictable and if you understand occlusion you can start to get predictability into all of your restorations excellent i certainly agree with you that occlusion will affect just about every discipline in dentistry what do you say to someone that goes through a curriculum uh, and for example starts let's say working with coice appliances and and the patient uh, continues to break those appliances and they just get frustrated and go to the final restoration what I do you think do? you need to yeah I think you have to have a, a broader knowledge of occlusion um, not every appliance will work for every patient and so you've got to be able to have more than one uh, particular option in your locker and I think that's the lovely thing about dentistry you know yourself that if you put 10 dentists in the room and see that same patient there'll be 10 different treatment plans okay because we all have a different way at the end of the day hopefully we'll get the patient treated um, to what the patient would like to have as an end result but there's many many ways of getting there um, so I think people need to have a broader idea not just stick to one appliance only that's very smart and I'm sure you're gonna give us a little bit of uh, feedback and some toolboxes to use uh, in our uh, in our clinical practice it's funny that you said that because uh, uh, there's a saying that says a camel is a horse made by a committee and uh, <laughs> and I can certainly relate to that um, very good uh, Dr. Tipton we are actually very excited we have had a lot of uh, um, contacts about this particular webinar like to hear um, some uh, input from Europe uh, um, as well and uh, with that said I'm gonna go ahead and start switching you over to our presentation so we can get started with this wonderful topic um, um, Dr. Tipton you have the floor okay thank you very much indeed uh, and good uh, as we said before good morning good afternoon good evening good night depends on uh, where you are in the world um, thank you very much dr. Shah for the the introduction uh, I don't need to go through this first uh, slide because it's all been said uh, and so let's get into uh, the bulk of what I'm going to be talking about today which is how do we treat wear cases what different ways have we got so first of all, let's look at the etiology uh, of wear. And if we look at that etiology, we've got a couple of things happening. Um, a couple of, uh, I'll call them disease processes for the, for the sake of it. We've got somebody who's clenching and grinding their teeth. And we may have somebody who's got erosion at the same time. Uh, it may just be erosion. But these are the two major causes of tooth surface loss. Uh, and potentially the bruxism can go on um, to create um, temporal mandibular joint disease. So what is it about bruxism? And I think we have to understand that bruxism is obviously parafunction, non-normal function. And if we look at the studies, to give you an idea, um, as I go through the presentation, I'll uh, ask you, the, the listener, as many questions as I can, just to try to focus the, the mind. So the first question I'm going to ask you is, or, or ask you to do is, to clench your teeth as hard as you possibly can. So all of you, please go out there and just clench your teeth as hard as you possibly can. Okay, now, if we look at the forces involved there, the forces involved are around about 30 to 60 Newton centimeter. That's your maximum biting force. However, what stops you biting harder? So if I say to you now, clench harder, come on, clench harder, clench harder, clench harder. There, you, you cannot clench any harder and the reason being that we have something thank goodness called proprioception and that proprioception is like a little switch and that proprioception when it's on overrides the conscious so the unconscious proprioception is saying to the conscious self do not clench any harder otherwise you'll create some damage you'll cause damage somewhere and that damage can be somewhere in the masticatory system that may be in the joints in the muscles, the periodontal ligaments, or the teeth themselves. Now, what happens at nighttime? 
at night time we go to sleep and that little switch called peri uh, proprioception is switched off. So now when we start to clench during uh, para function at night time, we've got no inhibitory reflex, which says do not bite as hard. And so now it's been shown that we can now start to clench and grind with 300 Newton per centimeter squared. So we're now talking about a five to 10 times the force. Now, again, at this stage, you know, time out, just think about that force. Think about your maximum biting force now and me saying to you, bite harder, bite harder, and you're not able to bite 5% harder. What does it feel like to think biting five times or 10 times as hard? That's our problem with bruxing. Next part is that if we look at again at the studies uh, and how long our teeth are in contact for in a normal waking day so let's say 16 hours we're awake a normal waking day our teeth are in contact depending on the study you read anywhere between about four and 15 minutes and those are fleeting contacts as we're chewing as we swallow and we close our teeth together those are fleeting contacts when we are clenching and grinding at night time then those forces um, five to 10 times as hard can be there for three to four hours. So instead of four to 15, four to 12 minutes, three to four hours. Uh, and that led a very, very learned colleague of mine uh, to go and say um, that one night of bruxing is equivalent to a lifetime of chewing. So that's the problem we've got with bruxism and it can cause all sorts of problems as you well know. These are some of the signs and symptoms that we have of wear, temporal mandibular joint disease, um, often caused by bruxing, not always, but often caused by bruxing. Let's look through these. And as we look through these signs and symptoms, guys, please yourself do a mental audit. Um, Dr. Shah said that this is something that's happening to so many people. Um, patients and dentists obviously are seeing it. Um, a quick mental audit in your own practice, whatever that practice is, um, mental audit of your adult patients, what percentage of them are suffering from any, not all, any of these signs and symptoms. So they have a, a history of fractured teeth, um, fractured restorations, palatal cusps which have fractured off, buccal cusps which have fractured off, um, vertical um, fractures down the long axis or lower molar tooth completely fractured in half with no restorations there whatsoever. What percentage of your patients have got temporal mandibular joint problem? Maybe clicking or crepitus in the joint. Maybe they've got um, pain around their joint. How many patients, what percentage have got muscular pain, suffering from headaches, headaches here, headaches behind the eyes, many headaches in the masseters, into the neck. Um, what amount of your patients have got faceting, have got worn teeth, their teeth are wearing down prematurely, um, dep dependent upon what age they obviously are. Abfraction lesions occurring at the neck of the tooth. We know that that's not caused totally by bruxing, but bruxing may well have uh, something to do with it. And what about perio? What percentage of your patients who do not have periodontal disease have still got recession defects and has still got mobility. So add up all of these and you can only answer for your practice. Um, commonly when I'm lecturing in the UK, then I ask that question and most of the dentists I'm lecturing to will say 80 to 90%. Some of the, some of the dentists are gonna say 100%. Don't believe them, but okay, let's say 80 to 90%. Um, I go throughout the Middle East and in the Middle East, when I ask that same question, it's more like 60 to 70%. Uh, and what I'd like to call this is not where, I'd like to call this occlusal disease. I'd like to call this occlusal disease because this now puts it into context. And here's the context. Um, if you've seen somebody and they've got periodontal disease, what happens if you don't treat that periodontal disease? patient might get worse and what does the patient do he litigates against you there's a lawsuit against you because you have neglected the patient and there's a negligence suit against you okay let's look at caries as well 
a patient's coming to you and they're constantly got caries in the mouth. You're doing nothing about it. You've not restored them. Uh, the caries lesions are getting worse and worse. Again, that's another lawsuit and that's negligent. But so many dentists are looking at this amount of wear and it, it's getting bigger and bigger, the, the, the problem. And they're just sitting there and not doing an awful lot about it. And that is called negligence. So we have to understand that we can't just sit there and say, oh, your teeth are wearing down a little bit. Oh, well, it's just one of those things. We have to start treating it. Uh, and we can treat it in uh, one of many ways. But you would never dream of a patient who's got periodontal disease in your practice who needs restorations. You would never dream of doing the restorations without sorting out the periodontal disease first. Correct? Likewise, somebody's got caries but needs a lot of multiple restorations, crowns, bridges, or whatever. You would not dream of doing the crowns and bridges and leaving caries, le caries lesions around the rest of the mouth. You'll go in and you'll treat the caries. You'll look at the diet. You'll get some fluoride in there. You'll restore the teeth, put some cores in, and then go and do the restorative dentistry, the crown and bridge work. Okay, what happens with occlusal disease? You see these signs and symptoms. These signs and symptoms aren't just there because something's happened. These signs and symptoms are there because the patient's suffering from an occlusal problem. The bruxing and occlusion is causing problems. And I'm just calling that disease for the time being. What should you do? You should go and treat the occlusal disease number one and then do the restorations. So let's look at how we start to treat these occlusal disease patients number one let's just go back one slide number one we have three ways of treating our patients number one is to stop them brushing okay how do we do that trials have been out there hypnotism um you will stop brushing you will stop brushing guess what doesn't work uh trying to reduce the stress okay what causes brushing most of it is stress Yes, there could be airway, pro airway problems, uh, but most of it is stress. Uh, and can we stop stress from affecting our patients? Answer is no, we can't. Certainly as dentists, we can't. So we're not going to be able to treat the stress at source very often. So we have to accept that our patients will be stressed and therefore they will be bruxing. So we have two options now to try to work with or control the bruxing okay number one simple thing put something between the teeth so that when the patient bruxes that something acts as a shock absorber and therefore the stress does not go to the teeth the ligaments the joints the muscles uh, it's a little bit like somebody who's um, banging their head against a brick wall constantly you put a pillow you put some foam against the brick wall so when he hits his head against the brick wall he doesn't damage his head anymore. That's basically what the occlusal splint is doing. It is absorbing the stress and stopping any future breakdown of the masticatory system. Um, and we use various um, types of splint. Um, it's interesting. There are many, many splints out there. You know, uh, lots of people go and put their names to splints. Um, I use mostly a Michigan splint or a Tanner appliance. Um, those are full coverage. As you can see on your screen here, this is a full coverage, hard acrylic, fully adjusted splint. So I use a uh, Michigan splint, the upper splint, for a class one and class two patient. And I use a Tanner appliance, which is this splint only in the lower jaw for a class three patient. Uh, and what's our problems? Our problems is are that two things. Number one, a good splint is expensive. It's expensive, not particularly to make, but to fit. It takes a lot of grinding in in the patient's mouth to get it so it's exactly right and doing its job. Therefore, it's an expensive item of work. Number two, it's removable. So we don't know if our patients are actually using it or not. And we always have the problem if we're relying on the splint to stop any damage occurring to our beautiful veneers that we've done, our onlays, etc. 
and we're relying on the splint, very easy for the patient to say, yes, I've been wearing my splint, doctor. Absolutely, every single night I'm wearing them. And it was just during the day when I had a chicken sandwich that this broke. And our problem is we have no real way of disproving them. So we use a lot of splints, but we shouldn't have to rely on them totally. Because if we rely on them totally, we cannot be sure our patient is actually going to wear them. So our second option is the splint. Uh, and my preference, as I said before, is a fully adjusted, full coverage splint. Now, I know lots of people like uh, Coist Appliances, other people like B splints, some people like anterior jigs, um, those sorts of things. I don't like anterior splints on their own. Great at treating muscles, not great at treating joints. From my point of view, to treat a joint problem, you also need to have posterior stability. Uh, for treating muscles, yes, an anterior splint works very well. Very well. Um, I don't like soft splints, bike raising appliances. They don't work at all in my eyes. Uh, a very nice study done in the British Dental Journal about 12 months ago uh, by Professor Nairn Wilson looked at all different types of splints and found in his research, his conclusions were that the fully adjusted full upper or lower splint was the only one that would work most of the time and also when it didn't work would not cause any further damage. And I think that's one of the other problems. We know anecdotally soft splints do work in some people, but in other people they don't work, but they cause damage. Anterior splints work in some people very well, but in other people they can cause damage. That damage that can be caused is can, can be caused by over eruption. So we have to be aware that if we do put something in the mouth, number one, let's make sure that it doesn't do any further damage. And number two, let's hope it does some good for our patients. Our third treatment, and this is obviously where I'm going to be concentrating in this presentation, is actually restoring the patient. Uh, and when we restore them, we have to restore them in a different way. Otherwise, if we restore them the way they've been restored previously, it's going to fail again. Um, remember, Einstein had that lovely quote that the definition of uh, being an idiot is trying the same thing time and time again and expecting a different result. So let's not be idiots. Let's start to use our brain, understand, and let's try and restore them in a different way. So restoration, I'm going to put into two parts. We're going to have restoration with composites and we're going to have restoration with ceramic. Um, I like to use composite a lot as a trial material. Uh, and if my patient can afford it, we will then transition to ceramic. If my patient can't afford it, then we will keep them going in composite for as long as we can. Uh, and bear in mind that the composite maybe is lasting in that five to seven year period before it needs to be replaced. So let's give you a couple of examples of the composite, first of all. Now, I love these two slides. This is my, my favorite slides, I think, whenever I lecture anywhere around the world. Uh, and this emphasizes so much that if you understand occlusion, occlusion can be so, so easy. Remember, all we're doing with occlusion is sticking to certain rules and principles and getting the bike right as we go up and down like this, getting the bike right when we go forwards and backwards, and getting the bike right when we go from side to side. That's basically it. And there's a lot of rubbish talked all the way around it, but we just got five basic principles, which I'm gonna introduce you to today. And if we get those five principles right, we're gonna get predictable success every single time. So what do we see here? We look on the left-hand screen, and let's just go through the teeth and see what we see on the teeth. First of all, upper central incisor. What can we see on that incisor ledge? You can see there's a bit of wear taking place there. Lateral incisor looks the same length, if not even a little bit longer than the central. So something's happened there that the central's worn down. The lateral's now becoming slightly half moon shaped here. So wear's uh, occurred there. Let's look at the opposing teeth. You've got a wear facet, beautiful wear facet occurring here. You can see another one just there. Maybe there's a hint of dentine starting to be exposed. 
we move on to the canines, the canines which should obviously be pointed teeth are no longer pointed, they've worn down. Um, we now look at the posterior teeth. So this is my patient going into a right lateral excursive movement. So from intercuspal, they're slid out to the right. They've slid out until their canines are more or less edge to edge. And as you can see, every single upper tooth and lower tooth are now more or less sliding together. So we'll call that group function. Okay, definition of group function, two or more teeth um, sliding into uh, lateral excursion, discluding the non-working side. I can't see if it's discluding the non-working side or not. But let's now think about bruxing. This patient is going to now brux at night. What's going to happen? As we brux at night, those two teeth are wearing down, those two teeth are wearing down, those two teeth, those two teeth, etc., etc. They're all wearing down. We're like a cow going from side to side now all the teeth are going to start to wear down. As the teeth wear down, we'll come on to this a little bit later, the guidance starts to get shallower and shallower. The guidance gets shorter and shorter. And there's a greater chance that a balancing side contact will now come into contact. As we come into contact with a balancing side contact, that starts to create class two leverage. And we'll talk about the theory of levers and how detrimental class two leverage is. So what do we do? We do a simple canine rise. So this is now just a composite that's been placed onto the upper canine to replace its shape. Uh, maybe we put a little bit of a bevel on the palatal aspect, a little bit of a bevel on the buccal aspect. With today's composites, as you can see, initially when they're done, at least, it blends in very, very nicely to the tooth. You can't see the restoration there. We've got lots and lots of enamel to bond to, so it's going to be strong. It's not going to come off. It may wear down. It may chip, but it's certainly not going to come off. And what we've done, what have we done? We've gone now and lifted. We'll call this thing lifted. We've produced a canine rise, which has now lifted in right lateral excursion all the rest of the teeth upon. So when my patient now bruxes to the right-hand side, all he's going to be doing is slowly wearing down that one composite and protecting the central the central the lateral the lateral the premolars okay i'm stopping a balancing side contact from occurring class two leverage from occurring it's such a simple simple thing to do and with all due respects i don't know my audience i'm talking to but if i'm talking to the uk and in the uk um most of the dentistry is done still on the NHS, about 60% of it. And most NHS practitioners see maybe 20 to 30 patients a day. I say to my guys who I'm teaching in the NHS, you should probably be doing at least three or four of these a day. Every single patient you're seeing, probably 80 to 90% have got occlusal problems. Probably half of those, 40 to 50% of your patients would probably benefit from a simple canine rise stop any further wear from occurring time out let's now think about what's happening let's think about the rest of these teeth do they want restoring does the patient want to have some veneers in place the canine rise is now protecting everything and that's the first thing they should be looking to do is go and test out your new occlusal scheme especially if it's a, a small scheme it's not a full mouth reconstruction test it out with composite put a composite canine rise back in place. Now, obviously, this can get worse and worse, and it can affect more and more of the teeth. And when it affects more of the teeth, then very often it may not just be canines that we're doing. It may be that we're going to be doing bigger composite restorations. Composite restorations uh, on the whole of the uh, anterior teeth. So in protrusion, in right lateral, in left lateral, we've got disclusion. We've got class three leverage, come back to it a little bit later. Our goal of therapy, our goal of treatment is always to produce class three leverage. Okay, so from an occlusal point of view, boil it down. You have one thing to do in life to, with the occlusion is identify any class two leverage in the mouth, get rid of it, replace it with class three leverage. That's all you have to do. There's multiple ways to do it but that's your reason d'etre 
for working with occlusion. So we're now going to come on to ceramic, and I'm going to go through quite a few cases uh, of using ceramic. Uh, and we're going to go from non-preparation, so ways of treating a wear and erosion, non-preparation, all the way up to full mouth reconstruction. Okay, so we're going to show you, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you put 10 dentists in a room with the same patient. We've got 10 different treatment plans. We've got 10 different ways of doing it all. So I'm not saying now that this is the only way to do it. We have multiple ways. So I'm going to show you some ways where we do no preparation, some ways where we do some preparation, and some where we do a full mouth reconstruction. Okay, and it's up to you to understand which way we do each key, each case. When do I do it this way? When do I do it another way? So let's look at our first case. The goal of my treatment is going to be to create some space so I can restore. I can either restore in composite or in this case in ceramic. And when I do restore, I want to restore with a different style of occlusion. Because remember, that definition of being an idiot is doing the same thing time and time again and expecting a different result. So if our patient has got a worn dentition, an occlusal problem, if we restore them to exactly the same way as they were before, guess what? The same thing will happen. So again, we have to have time out and do something differently. And in this case, we need to start thinking about reorganizing the occlusion. So here's our first patient. Let's look at him and see what we can see. Um, we can see that, uh, well, first of all, give you some background. Uh, he is 44, 45 years of age. He's highly stressed. He owns hotels uh, and uh, he comes to me uh, and you'll see his problem in just a minute. OK, what can we see? We can see, first of all, that we've got some faceting going on here. Look at the uh, upper left central incisor. Uh, look at the lateral. We've got some wear taking place here, uh, a chip out of that one. What else can you see? I can see an awful lot of translucency in there. Uh, we've got erosion taking place on the labial surface as well. So it uh, will come as no surprise to you that the palatal aspects now look like this. So simple case of erosion. There's probably a little bit of wear going on there as well, a bit of abruxing. But this is a nice combined case where we've got tooth wear due to bruxism and we've got erosion on top of each other. OK. What do we see? We see the erosion. We see the dentine exposed. <clears throat> his major problem is his front teeth are sensitive. Um, he realizes that they're feeling a little bit thin. He can see through them in parts. Uh, I'm looking at these teeth and thinking, yes, they are getting very, very thin. And what I want to do is I want to bond some restorative material onto the palatal aspects to get rid of the sensitivity, obviously, but also to give them some bulk and some strength back again. What's my problem? My problem is I have no space. So my lower incisors are now hitting into that very worn palatal aspect. And this is a very interesting thing that we have to understand. We're going to talk through this presentation about vertical dimension and what happens to vertical dimension as we go through life. The first thing I'd like you to remember is that we have compensatory mechanisms. Those compensatory mechanisms are called alveolar bone growth and cementum deposition. And guess what, guys? That is happening throughout life. If I go and take an upper five and grind it down, what's going to happen to the lower five? It's going to over erupt. This is happening all the time, this over eruption. So we have alveolar bone growth, cementum deposition, which has meant that even though I've worn the palatal surface away, and lost maybe two millimeters or so, my lower incisor has now over erupted by two millimeters into that area. So if I'm going to put some restorations in here, I have no space. So let's look at ways of creating space. OK, I've got four ways of creating space. Let's look at the easy ones, first of all, because sometimes the easy one is the, the route that you take. Let's look at the lower incisors. Are the lower incisors over erupted? If the lower incisors are over erupted, then by all means, grind them down, reshape them. From time to time, you're going to find maybe the occlusal plane is wrong, especially we see this in a, a class two 
Div 1 patient from time to time. Class 2 Div 2 as well, where the lower anterior is over erupt. Uh, aesthetically, they don't look very good because you show too much tooth. And especially if the incisal edges are jagged, the patient may well benefit from having the lower incisors reduced. So we won't do it that often. We don't particularly want to do it with healthy teeth. We don't want to take two tissue away for no reason, but it's an option for some patients. And I'll show you a case of that later. Number two, increase vertical dimension. So let's increase vertical dimension around the whole mouth. So how can we do that? Um, we could do full crown work, but that is going a bit OTT for this. Uh, let's look at the rest of the dentition. Uh, and here's his upper study cast. And what can we see? We can see he's got fillings, worn fillings in his premolars, occlusals. We've got a large uh, MOD composite, uh, I think, amalgam or composite there. We've got an MO here. We've got a worn MOD there, an occlusal here, an occlusal and occlusal. So all his posterior teeth are now restored. So we could simply, in its easiest form, just go back and redo those restorations. But instead of having cusp angles, which are quite steep and a deep fossy, bring the fossy up a little bit, make the cusp angles a little bit shallower. That's increasing vertical dimension at the back of the mouth only by replacing worn restorations. And that way we can then create some space at the front. So very straightforward way to go and do it. Um, Quick question aside, if you are going to do that, then important we do it the right way round. Do we do posteriors first, jack open the bite, jack open the anteriors, and then fill in the anterior space with our composites? Or do we do the anteriors first, jack open the back, and then restore the posteriors? Let you think about that. Okay. Answer is always do the anteriors first because the anteriors are not only there to create an occlusal stop, the anteriors are there for aesthetics, anteriors are there for phonetics, and the anteriors are there to give you anterior guidance. So we have to test them first of all. If we've done the posteriors first and set a certain vertical dimension and then fill in at the front, what happens if the patient's really struggling to speak? We're now in a dilemma. So always do the anteriors first of all, put the restorations in place, get the aesthetics correct, number one, get the occlusion correct, so we've got good protrusive and lateral guidance and disclusion at the back of the mouth, get the phonetics right, and when that's right, fill in the spaces at the back of the mouth. Always anteriors first, posteriors after. That's our second um, option. Third option is an occlusal one. 90% of our patients have a slide from retreated contact position to intercuspal position. We'll talk more about occlusion in a little while. Um, that means that if I take 90% of my patients, if I take them back to the condyles being in RAP and take them back by manipulation to retreated contact position, as far as I'm concerned, ideal position of condyle in fossa, that means that there'll be space between all the rest of the teeth. And if I've got space between all the rest of the teeth, I can now fill in that space. Now, especially if I've got a horizontal slide, okay? 10% of slides are horizontal. 90% of our patients have a slide. Do your own math. That means 9% of your patients have got a horizontal slide. What does that mean? That means that this is the incisal relationship at the moment in intercuspal. When I now manipulate them back to retreated contact position, the lower incisors move back to here. I now go and do an occlusal adjustment. So I have a posterior stable dentition at the back and my lower incisors are still here. All I do now is restore the palatal aspect to contact. So a way of creating space is eliminating a horizontal slide, not eliminating a vertical slide. You won't gain space that way, but eliminate a horizontal slide 9% of patients have them. And one of the options there is that you can then restore the anteriors back into contact. So that's our third way. Our fourth way, and the way I'm going to describe to you now, is a method that was 
uh, first discussed in 1970 in Scandinavia, and this is called the Dahl Appliance. Okay, D A H L, Dahl Appliance. Um, and this is basically an orthodontic appliance. Uh, Bjorn Dahl, uh, a restorative dentist back in uh, Sweden uh, in the 1970s, came up with this uh, concept. And it's a, a orthodontic appliance, like a bite plane, like an anterior bite plane. That's when it's placed uh, on the anterior teeth, if it's done correctly, and I'll show you how, it encourages intrusion of the lower anteriors over eruption of the posteriors. Once the dial appliance has done its work, we take it out and we have space between the lower anteriors and the upper anteriors. So let me walk you through this case and I'll talk about the dial appliance as we go along. So number one is we mount our study casts. Um, so this is going to be um, the idea behind uh, my treatment for the anterior erosion, create space with the dial appliance, and then I'm going to restore them with prepless palatal veneers. So number one uh, is mount the study cast around RAP. That's number one. Number two, have a look at the amount of space that you've got. And what we're looking to do is create at least the amount of space needed for the restoration that we're going to be doing. So in this case, I need a minimum of two millimeters, maybe even three. So mount around RAP. Open up the pin now until I've got at least two to three millimeters of space anteriorly. That's stage number one. Part two, the dial appliance is made, it's, it's, it's standard technique, its original concept was linked Maryland style wings. In fact, the first um, dial appliance that was uh, discussed was in fact a chrome cobalt denture, a small denture which was fitted onto the plate glass beds. Because this is 1970, before we're doing Maryland's acid etching, etc. So it was a removable chrome, which was worn. Uh, but now we've moved on to either, as you see here, splinted Maryland wings, acid etch, uh, adhesive wings, or we can do it in composite. Okay, I'm doing it classically here. I'll tell you how we can do it in composite a little bit later. Uh, and what are we doing? So these are now two to three millimeters thick. Uh, you'll see that they've got a certain shape to them. So you can see that we've got a palatal shelf. This is hugely important. The idea of the palatal shelf is so that when the lower incisors hit this shelf, the technician waxes up the dial appliance. So the shelf, the angulation of that palatal shelf hits the lower incisors at 90 degrees. So the lower incisors, the first movement that occurs is the lower incisors get pushed down their long axis. So they get intruded down their long axis. Think for a second, what would happen if that ramp, that shelf was not there and we just created a thick inclined plane? The lower incisors would now hit this thick inclined plane. All the rest of the teeth are apart. What will happen to them? They'll be forced lingually. They won't be forced down the long axis. They'll be forced lingually. We'll gain some space. We'll get some over eruption of the posteriors. We'll take the dial appliance off. We will think we've got adequate space. We'll restore the anteriors. That's fine. But what's going to happen long term? You've now pushed those lower incisors lingually. What's going to happen with the tongue? Muscles always win. You know this, guys. Muscles always win with any orthodontics. So the muscles, the tongue will now start to push those lower incisors back into the rightful position. And that will either lead to mobility of the uppers, mobility of the lowers, pain, or the upper anterior teeth maybe even drifting forwards and losing aesthetics. So number one, mount around retruded axis position. Why am I saying that? If you mount around intercuspal and you increase vertical dimension and make this dial appliance, what happens when you put the dial appliance in the mouth? No posterior teeth, no interdigitation. The condyles are going to go back up to RAP. What's going to happen in the relationship between that ramp and the lower incisors? The lower incisors may end up going back to here on a different area of the ramp again, in which case they'll get lingualized again. So number one, mount around RAP, not ICP, hugely important. 
Number two is get the ramp so it pushes the lower incisors downwards. And then we wear this for a period of time. It's cemented in the mouth with a um, glass on a cement so we can get on and off when we want to. And we wait for over eruption to occur. Now, we talked earlier, predictability. Predictability of dial appliances. How predictable are they? Very predictable in the young patient, not as predictable in the older patient. We know, we've mentioned already, um, alveolar bone growth cementum deposition. Okay, This is cellular turnover. What do we know to cellular turnover as we get older? It slows down. So the amount of over eruption that will occur and the speed of over eruption will get slower and slower as we get older and older. So the dial appliance is for the younger patient. What do I call younger patient? 50 and under. And if I was doing the dial appliance now, if this case was somebody in her 20s, I'd expect the dial appliance to have done its job in probably four to six weeks. Somebody in her 30s, that's six to eight weeks. This guy's in his 40s, I'm expecting three months. 50s, four months. I'm getting 50, 60, 70. This might take six, nine months, 12 months. It might never happen. Or it might be occurring so slowly that the patient is getting fed up of the actual treatment. So it's very much predictable in the younger patient. The older the patient gets, the less predictability we have. Okay, so we are waiting for over eruption to occur. What's it feel like for the patient? What do we say? Is this going to cause pain? Answer, no. They have to be splinted. Guys, this has to be splinted. If you do this with individual ones, and this is some of the problem I have with composite, some people like to try to cheat, get around it quicker, uh, and therefore just do the final restorations themselves, final restorations initially, and then leave them and let the posteriors over erupt. Well, two things can happen there. Doing the final restorations freehand, we might not get the intrusion, we might get lingualization. We mentioned that's a problem. And what else could happen? If we don't splint those anteriors and we leave just the four front teeth high, we can get one of those teeth starting to drift forwards. So it's essential we also splint. So rule number three, we have to split. And we now wait. The patient, is it going to be painful? No. Is it going to be comfortable? Well, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable for the first probably couple of weeks or so. But if you think about if I'm opening up the anterior by, let's say, three millimeters, then that's basically the molars, second molars are out of contact by about one millimeter. You know, the three to one ratio maybe two and a half to one, but we'll call it three to one. Uh, and how long is it going to take for a molar and a molar opposing each other, each of them to over up by half a millimeter? Probably a couple of weeks. So within two weeks, we've now got a tripod. In dentistry, hugely important, tripods. Tripods everywhere gives us stability. So as soon as we get past the first couple of weeks, the patient will feel more and more comfortable and over a period of time, the sevens come in, the sixes, the fives, the fours, and the canines are the last ones to come in. So here we are, the time that we've cemented these in place. And as you can see at the moment, canines are around about one and a half, two millimeters out of contact. And we just wait. And we see our patient on a routine every two, three weeks, something like that. And we watch. And as you can see what happens, Here's our initial starting point. This is maybe after about four weeks, six weeks, something like that. Back teeth are in contact. And we're just waiting now for these to come into contact. What's our end point? Our end point is the canines all the way backwards, whole chimps off. Sometimes with the older patient. Some of our patients start pushing us. When can I start treatment? When, when, when? And you know what? From time to time, we may start to do the definitive treatment without all the teeth still being in contact. And we have two options. We either wait a bit longer, but still restore and wait for the other teeth to come into contact or add just a little bit of a composite onto the palatal surface somewhere to get contact. But ideally, classically, we wait for all the teeth to come into contact with Shimstop. We then take the doll appliance off and hey, presto, I have space. Okay, which is what we wanted. 
We could get the space by grinding the teeth, by opening vertical dimension, by doing a clusal adjustment, or the dollar flights. There's probably other ones, but those are the ones that I'm talking about now. And all we do now is simply take our impressions and restore them. So this is uh, upper impression, and we've got the um, model silver plated. As a prosthodontist, I love silver plated models, silver plated dyes. Nearly all of my work is done on silver plated models and dyes. Uh, I don't like the normal stone. They can chip and abrade uh, very, very easily. Obviously, we're doing more and more digital work now. But these are non-preparation, so simple impression. Put the dollar plants back as your temporary, otherwise you're going to get that over eruption of the lower anteriors. So the dollar plants goes back as your temporary. And then all we have is the final end result. And the final end result looks exactly the same as the initial, apart from the fact that you cannot see through these teeth. These teeth are now thicker and stronger. So our first case, dollar plants and palatal veneers. Minimum preparation to the extent no preparation. Let's look at our next case. Next case, we're going to go and do a little bit more. Uh, this is going to involve a complex case where we're going to do anterior crowns. We're going to do five to five anterior upper restorations, but we're still going to use the doll appliance principles to help us gain space. Okay? As you all know, we can gain space. We've talked about it by either opening up the vertical, by maybe in terms of crown work, grinding down the palatal aspects of the crowns, but also think what happens if you did five to five crown preps, did minimal or no preparation on the occlusal surface and palatal surfaces, put your prototypes on, your temporaries, I call them prototypes, put your prototypes on and leave them high for a period of time, what will happen? The sixes and sevens will come back into contact, reestablish contact, You've now opened the vertical up all the way around without having to have done anything to good sixes and sevens. And the doll appliance has meant that you didn't have to do any palatal or occlusal preparation. So I use a lot of doll appliances to get this movement when I'm doing crown work as well, just so I can minimize the amount of two prep that I do. Anyway, let's look at the case. Uh, so we have typically uh, the guy again is about 45 years of age. Uh, you'll see from his teeth, he's a horizontal clencher and grinder side to side. Uh, what I'd like you to look at here also is his aesthetics. So this is combining occlusion, dial appliances and aesthetics. Um, and the, what's the first thing you look at aesthetics here? The thing that stands out for me is his lips. His lips look weird. They're strange. OK, and why are they weird and strange? They're weird and strange because this is a normal smile. This is his exaggerated smile, his e -e -e -e, like this. Uh, and his lips are exaggerated because for the last 20 years or so, he's been smiling with his lips pursed so that he's trying to protect anybody from seeing his teeth by making his lips into a certain shape so that he doesn't have to show the teeth which he is very, very uh, worried about and embarrassed about. Now, this is a really important part. If I'm going to do some anterior restorations, you know yourself, there's an intimate relationship between lower incisal edge position and lip, upper incisal edge position and lip. And that relationship changes throughout life. As we get older, as we know, our musculature drops down and we see a lot more lower tooth, a lot less upper tooth. So when I'm doing any aesthetic dentistry, absolutely essential that I get that relationship between incisal edge and lip correct. What can I do here? His lips are so distorted, I don't know the correct position for the lips. Therefore, how am I going to get around that? I'm going to get around that by putting some prototypes in long term. So rather than doing some crown veneer preparations two weeks later, fit them. I'm going to put my prototypes in. I'm going to leave them for three months, even four months. So the patient can get used to his new smile. His lips start to relax as he becomes more comfortable. 
and then I can get the true relationship between incised ledge and lip, and then I can go to my definitives. Okay, so in my own mind, forget dollar appliances for anything else at the moment. From my own mind here, this patient has to wear his prototypes, provisionals, temporaries, call them what you will. He has to wear his prototypes for three to four months so that his lips can relax. That gives me time now also to incorporate doll appliance principles into the prototypes. So we take our photos and you can see um, other thing that's interesting here. And this is a clue. We're going to talk about vertical dimension I mentioned in a minute. Um, how can we tell if somebody's lost vertical dimension? Answer is we can't. We may have a bit of a, uh, a gut feel that somebody's lost vertical, uh, but we have no way of knowing how much vertical is lost, what his vertical should be. We may be able to say what his vertical ideally would like it to be, but we've not got any real knowledge of if somebody has lost vertical. Reason being, we do not have standardized photographs of him every five, 10 years of his life to see what's happening to his nose chin distance and how much of that is physiological in any case. But we can get an idea from time to time. So if we have somebody who goes through wear slowly, normal wear, then as I said before, we'll get over eruption. What are we seeing here? This is the M position. Look at me, okay? M, you see teeth. Why are we not seeing teeth here? Maybe we're not seeing teeth because that over eruption is not occurring quickly enough. So the physiological rate of over eruption is happening much more slowly than the actual rate of wear. So when you do the M position, if you don't see teeth, really good indicator that somebody's lost vertical dimension. So we start to look at his teeth. And as we can see, we're a horizontal bruxus. So this is his intercostal position. You can see his edge to edge. Another question to ask you, does that mean that he's really a class three patient? Or is he posturing? And if I take him back to RAP, will he go into a class one? Or again, is this a vertical dimension loss? Okay, because we're opening on a hinge, as you know, like this, what happens when we lose vertical dimension? The lower teeth come forwards and upwards into more of a class three. So this for me is somebody who started out as a class one occlusion, normal overbite and overjet. And over a period of the last 10, 15, 20 years, he's been wearing them down. The vertical dimension has reduced. The, the chin's got closer to the nose. The lower anterior teeth are coming upwards and forwards. And we're now into a class three. So what I wanna do as part of my overall treatment plan is restore him back to a class one occlusion. I'm always trying to restore to a class one occlusion. Why? Simple, class one occlusion, lovely overbite and overjet, I've got great guidance. So I'm always gonna try to get there if I possibly can. So we've done a little bit of bleaching just to make them a little bit lighter because we're gonna be doing some translucent restorations in place. So my goal of treatment here Create space for restorations, establish a reorganized occlusion. So I think it's important now that we start to talk about occlusion and our five principles. Okay. As I said earlier in the introduction, um, one of the problems we have in dentistry is that occlusion does not get taught enough at university. I'll give you an instance for me, for me anyway. Um, I think it was probably third BBS, my um, second year at dental school. First year was all about anatomy, physiology, biochemistry. Second year, we spent one full term, okay, uh, doing medical microbiology and oral pathology. So that was one day a week over a term. Uh, the term lasted 12 weeks. So that's 12 full days we spent. Now, number one, have I ever in my last 40 years of clinical dentistry looked down a microscope and was able to identify Langham cells, for instance. So the medical microbiology, bacteriology, oral pathology, looking down a microscope, has it been any use to me whatsoever? Answer is, in a practicing career, no. It may have been useful for one or two of you from time to time. 
how many lectures did I have on occlusion? I had two lectures. Nine o'clock till 10 o'clock, two days. I may have had a bit of a hangover that day as well as a student, so I may have missed one. It would have been great for me, for all our dentists, to have had 10 days of occlusion. 10 days of occlusion would have been fantastic. I can teach everybody occlusion in six days. We do it on our courses that we run in the UK. A six-day course on occlusion. And then you know all of it. You start to be able to put that into practice. So our problem is we're not taught it at university. And therefore, when I start to teach people about occlusion, the amount of knowledge they have is probably about on the undersurface of the sole of their shoe. And I've got to get them up to here. And that's a steep, steep curve. Let's look at composites, adhesion. Okay, you know composites, you taught composites, adhesion at university, at dental school. Therefore, you get out into the big wide world, you see some of the top uh, people talk about a, a composite and adhesion. You can understand it. You can increase your knowledge by 5, 10, 15 percent and you're there. But with occlusion, most dentists have so little knowledge to start off with that it's such a steep learning curve. So let's go through it. I'm going to spend 10 minutes on it now. Number one, let's make it easy. We have five principles, that's all five rules. Learn five rules. And this is all about getting the bite right when we go up and down. Getting the bite right when we go forwards and backwards. Getting the bite right side to side. That's all occlusion is. First rule, okay? And people get put off by the nomenclature. We've got two types of nomenclature. We've got the nethology nomenclature, which you can see here on the screen. We've got the Pankyman Shiloh Dawson nomenclature, which is centric relation, centric related occlusion. And we have to go and learn both languages. Okay? It's tough, but you have to spend a bit of time. You're an intelligent person. You passed all of your um, grades, all of your exams to get into university. You're qualified. You're an intelligent person. Do not tell me that this is beyond any of you if you want to take the time to learn it do go and take the time to learn it it will make you a better dentist what will it do it will give you predictability that's what we're after predictability for all your restorative cosmetic dentistry so first principle rcp equals icp around rap what do we mean about that we mean first of all get the condyle into the right position the ideal position of the condyle in the fossa is in its most superior. Some people talk about anterior position, but in its most superior position, condyle in the fossa. Okay, why is that? Well, number one, it's reproducible. Okay, intercuspal position, and a position which most of you will work to, is not reproducible. Okay, RAP is reproducible today, tomorrow, 5, 10, 15 years, 30 years later. I can get to that same position. I can teach dentists, okay? One, two, three, four, five. I can teach a whole class of 30 dentists to get that same position, okay? It's beautiful, reproducible every single time. What about intercuspal? Intercuspal is not reproducible. Intercuspal changes all the time, okay? Quick favor, put your head back like this horizontally, okay? Close your teeth together. Which teeth hit first? Your back teeth, okay? Put your head forwards, downwards now into like a feeding position close together, which teeth hit first? Front teeth. Question to you, which is intercuspal? Which one are you going to work to? So gravity affects intercuspal position. What's the definition of intercuspal? Maximum intercuspation, position of maximum intercuspation. What determines intercuspal position? Shapes of teeth, how they fit together, okay? Shapes of teeth. So your intercuspal position is based on the shape of your teeth. What do dentists do every single day of their life? Change shapes. What do you think happens to intercuspal? It changes. Okay. Intercuspal position also dictates position of condyles. So condylar position is changing all the time as we do dentistry, if we don't do it very well, especially. So dentistry changes intercuspal. What else? We mentioned muscles bringing the teeth together into the correct position. What happens with muscles? Okay. Have you ever woken up in the morning and closed your teeth together and gone, oh, that's strange. My bite feels really weird today. 
I do sometimes. I know that I've been clenching and grinding that night. And my muscles are a little bit like this, tense. So it's now bringing my teeth together into a different position. What happens if I now go to the dentist and I have some crowns done today? And I have a jaw registration. I come back two weeks later. I've had a blissful night's sleep. My jaw position two weeks later and my jaw position today, different. What happens? We now put the crowns in. The bite's wrong. We have to go and grind and clench, etc. We're losing predictability. Isn't it easier to work to a reproducible position? RAP, work to it time and time again. It's reproducible every single day what else is good about it muscles are at their most relaxed okay think logic one of the problems we we have at dental school is we're not taught to think logically we talk a lot too much biology we mentioned that already with medical microbiology bacteriology etc so we're taught too much biology and not enough mechanics and engineering principles occlusion is not about biology. Occlusion is about mechanics and engineering principles. So if we are now going to engineer the new robot, the robotic form of uh, a human being, would the first thing you do be to have a joint where the lower part is not being loaded through the center of the upper part? Because that's what 90% is happening to our patients. 90% of our patients, their condyles, this is you as well, the condyles are here. I'm exaggerating, not exactly there, but the condyles are forwards and downwards on the eminentia. So rather than being in that midmost position, that stable bone brace position, the condyles are forwards and downwards on an inclined plane. And we now function, brooks and clench and grind, on an inclined plane. What do you think that does to the stability of the joints and all the muscles? It makes common sense. So the idea is try to get all the teeth together as the condyles are in RAP, the most muscular relaxed position. How do we do that? We do an occlusal adjustment first of all. I'm not talking equilibrations here, guys. I'm not talking going to the nth degree and spending hours and hours. I'm talking about doing a gross adjustment to get rid of the retruded contact position. So here's a guy who I'm manipulating around RAP. His first contact is in the uh, second molar area. Uh, you can't just see it's up here somewhere. All the rest of his teeth are apart. That's retruded contact. And what happens? Does he walk around in that position? Of course not. If you walk around in that position with one point of contact, you know what will happen. One of those teeth will get painful and if it gets painful, they get pulpitis. And the body knows that. The body has a fight or flight reflex, vasobagal reflex. So what does the body do? The body says, ah, oh, stop, stop, stop. Do not go around with your joints and muscles in the right place. No. That means that two teeth are contacting. What I'd like you to do is push your jaw forward and now open and close. And guess what? You don't hit on that tooth anymore. Problem solved. We don't get pulpitis. We've got rid of pain. However, we will now get long-term chronic damage in our teeth, the clenching and grinding, the wear faceting, the abfraction lesions, the recession, and also potential with muscles and joints. So all I'm talking about here is doing an occlusal adjustment. On 90% of patients, they have the RCP, ICP slide. 90% of those, that's 80% of patients have a vertical slide. Vertical slides are easy to adjust. Absolutely simple, easy to adjust. So 80% of the time, it's a slam dunk. Patients suffering from occlusal disease, what do we do? Treat the occlusal disease, restore. This is one of the ways. Not all of them, one of the ways. Number two, okay, when you're restoring, make sure you create a mutually protected occlusion. Okay, what's a mutually protected occlusion? Well, lithologists, um, I believe it, that certain teeth have got roles to play in the masticatory system. So what's the role of the back teeth? To clench and grind the food, okay? What's the role of the front teeth? To incise. So what we're talking about now is that back teeth should take vertical loading, front teeth should take horizontal tearing 
horizontal movement. So what I want to happen with my multi-protected occlusion is that when I tap up and down like this, I want my back teeth to hit just before my front teeth. Okay? And that's usually in the region of 10 to 20 microns. So back teeth take the shock absorbance. You know yourself, somebody who doesn't have back teeth, okay, what happens to their front teeth if they've got no back teeth? The front teeth slowly start to drift outwards, don't they? Why? Because anterior teeth cannot take vertical loading. So set up your occlusal scheme in this position with the condyles in the right position, muscles relaxed, bashing up and down, back teeth hitting just before front teeth. We can do that with adjustments. We can do that with restorations. Front teeth, 10 to 20 microns apart. What's the role of the front teeth? Role of the front teeth now is to guide movements in lateral and protrusive, the horizontal movements. So back teeth come apart. You know yourself again. If as you grind from side to side, back teeth come together, then cusps are likely to do this, to fracture off. We could get pain somewhere in the masticatory system. So this is our mutually protected occlusion. And we need to make sure that we get this into our restorations. So here is a, an unusual case, but it shows you how we go to, what extremes we go to, to get this mutually protected occlusion. For me, it's predictability every single time. And I can look patients in the eye and say, we will get a good result, a long lasting result. Okay, so what do we see here? We see a patient who's got canine to canine bridge, six unit canine to canine bridge, uh, replacing the four anteriors. Uh, so we've got four pontics here, the four incisors. Uh, I've then got a fixed movable bridge one side, fixed movable bridge the other side. So some classic restorative dentistry, all PFM. Uh, now let's look a little bit closer and you can see this palatal aspect here looks a little bit strange. What you'd normally look to see is that the palatal aspects would be sculpted so that these look like pontics and teeth and they sit on the gum like this. So now I've got about two to three millimeters of extra porcelain fused to metal, like a table hanging backwards. Okay, think about it. Why? Okay, let's give you some history. Patient's 40 odd years of age. Uh, lost a lot of teeth, been through NHS treatment, not been very good, lost teeth. But she's a class 2 Div 1 patient. Her lower anterior teeth are like this, no contact on the uppers, okay? So she's got no anterior tooth contact, therefore she's got no mutually protected occlusion. The anterior teeth cannot protect the posteriors. So if I left her with a normal bridge like this, with no anterior guidance, if she brooks and clenched and grinds, Okay, not all patients do, but if she did, she'd be clenching and grinding on her back teeth. Okay, and what do you think would happen to my porcelain? It's going to do this, or that stress. Remember, that's class two leverage. Talk about it in a minute. That stress goes to the joints. We want class three leverage wherever possible. We want the anteriors to protect the posteriors. So, what have I done here? We've created this ramp. Undersurface is totally convex, so we've shaped it so it's cleansable on the undersurface. And yes, the patient wears it in a prototype for a period of three months, first of all, just to make sure that they got used to it. Um, and then the patient, we transfer the patient to the definitive restoration. OK, but that takes a little bit of time, um, three months to get used to it. But the idea is now patient contacts here and here and here and here. And when we go into protrusive and lateral movements, back teeth come apart. Mutually protected occlusion. Next one, anterior guidance. What's anterior guidance? Anterior guidance is the influence of teeth over mandibular movement. So that's the definition. Uh, we put a caveat on it. And the caveat that goes on it is preferably anterior teeth. So anterior guidance is the influence of teeth, preferably anterior teeth over mandibular movement. What's posterior guidance? Posterior guidance, influence of condyles. So with anterior guidance, what we're looking to do is make sure that the front teeth dislute the back teeth, okay? Close together, all of you. Slide your jaw from side to side with your teeth together. What's guiding the way that your mandible moves is teeth. 
Teeth are guiding, that's anterior guidance. Next thing, open, teeth slightly apart, move your jaw from side to side. What's influencing the way that your jaw, your mandible moves? The shape of your condyles, the fossa. And all of you will move in a different way. You have a new, unique way, just like Irish, rec Irish recognition, thumbprints, you'll have a way that your mandible moves, okay? Completely dictated by your shape of your teeth, anterior guidance, shapes your condyles and fossa, posterior guidance. So we look at anterior guidance in two ways. We look at it as protrusive and we look at it as lateral. So first of all, in protrusive guidance, straightforward. Remember, we've got our rules and regulations, okay? In protrusive guidance, I want my lower four teeth sliding on the palatal aspects of my upper four teeth, back teeth come apart. Okay, simple rule. Now let's look at lateral. Lateral guidance. The normal lateral guidance we have, canine guidance. Okay, and the canines are great teeth. They're the longest lasting teeth. They're big and strong. They're in the right position. It's easy to do. Um, they've got long roots, etc. So the canine is the first choice. And when canines grind down, then we drop naturally on to some form of group function. But the canines are there to protect. So we go for canine guidance wherever we possibly can. However, let's just go back. One. Are there any instances where we wouldn't use canines? And the answer is yes. Um, think about when you give somebody guidance, when do you go into guidance? Right, guys, okay. do you, at the end of this presentation, go outside, have a cup of coffee, smoke a bit of fresh air and say to yourselves, I think I'll just go into guidance for a couple of minutes. When to do guidance? You go into guidance when you're brooks and clench and grind. Okay? That's when we go into guidance. When we go rrr, 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 at night time. So what I'm trying to do when I put my anterior guidance into a case is I start to look at teeth which are strong enough to take guidance. So I'm looking at right and left lateral. I'm looking at protrusive. And there are certain teeth that if you put into guidance, the patient bruxes on them, and those teeth are not strong enough to take the bruxing forces. You know which teeth those are. Post crowns, root filled teeth. Sometimes it's pontics. Sometimes a tooth with a large core. Uh, it may be a single tooth implant, a mobile tooth. Those teeth are not strong enough to take guidance. So we have canine guidance wherever possible, but we have to be aware that certain teeth cannot take them. They're not strong enough. So if I'm looking to set somebody's anterior guidance up, I'm looking for two things. I'm looking for teeth that are far enough forwards, okay, because that's class three leverage. Going to talk about that now. And I'm also looking for healthy teeth. So let's look at the theory of levers. Uh, and this is hugely important because this is engineering skills in the mouth. When I do these five principles, they're not my five principles. These are five principles of occlusion that have been laid down by much more intelligent people than me. All I do is adapt them and teach them in a particular way. But these five principles have been down there for years and years and years. Okay? The five principles are there to create less stress when we brooks and clench and grind. Now think about it, that is our sole purpose. We have somebody who's bruxing, clenching and grinding on your beautiful veneers. You can't stop him from bruxing. You can try and put a piece of plastic in, but what happens if he forgets that? Or number three, this is the important part, we now start to de-stress, take the stress out of the mouth. Take the force that he can brux and clench and grind with out of the mouth. So this is now our theory of levers. We've got three types of lever, um, and the mouth is, is a lever. We have three types of lever. We have class one, the classic seesaw. Uh, levers magnify forces, and a seesaw can magnify forces by up to 100 times. We then have class two leverage. The classic class two leverage is the nutcracker. You've all used the nutcracker. Then our class three leverage is the um, pincers, okay? Uh, is the um, tweezers that will take a hair out, okay? Let's look at the difference between class two and class three, okay? So a class two lever, lever, okay? Let's just look at my hand as being a class two lever, okay? The fulcrum is here, okay? 
So what do we do? Let's look at the nut tracker. So we put the nut close to the fulcrum and we now put our hand grip as far away as possible. We squeeze the leverage fractures the nut. OK, let's look at class three leverage. What happens when we go from class two to class three? So again, let's look at the nut cracker. Now, with class three leverage, all we do is we change the position of the nut and change the position of the power, the force. So class two leverage, the nut was next to the fulcrum. What we're going to do now is take the nut and put it as far away from the fulcrum as possible out here. And instead of us squeezing at the edge, we're going to squeeze somewhere in the middle. So the power will be between nut and fulcrum. Whereas previously for class two leverage, the power was a long way away from the fulcrum. Now the nut is a long way away. OK, what do you think is going to happen when you have your nut at the end? You squeeze in the middle. What's going to happen to the nut? Nothing. The nut never breaks. Therefore, question for you. If the mouth is a set of levers, do you want your patient to clench and grind in class two leverage on your veneers, the nutcracker, or do you want him to clench and grind in class three? The answer is, of course, class three leverage, wherever possible. That means having the teeth that he clenches and grinds on as far away from the fulcrum as possible with the power unit, the masseter, in the middle. That means, again, anterior guidance should be on anterior teeth. So when I'm looking to put certain teeth into guidance, okay, I'm saying to myself, okay, I'm going to allow you to clench and grind on that tooth, that tooth, and that tooth tonight, but not that one, that one, that one. And how do I choose? I choose the teeth that are furthest forwards, longest away from the joint, and also those that are as healthy as possible. That's the key to anterior guidance. Fourth principle, no non-working side interferences. Okay, why? Non-working side interference is a class two leverage. Okay, here's a nice case. This patient came to see me. Um, I advocated just doing a simple canine rise. Uh, also gave her the opportunity to have a splint afterwards as well. She said no. Um, she went away. Uh, came back 10 years later. Moved job, came back to the area 10 years later. This is what a dentition looked like. So what had happened, she was about 40 years of age, uh, or she was about 40 years of age here and about 50 here. So what happened in between this time? So up until this time, she'd been clenching and grinding just on her front teeth. Look, the side teeth, fine. Clenching and grinding on her front teeth, front teeth wearing down, the guidance getting shallower, 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 shallower as the front teeth wear down. Eventually, after 20, 30 years of wearing in class three leverage, now as she clenches and grinds, a non-working or balancing side contact comes in. Now she's clenching between her front teeth and the non-working side, balancing side contact. Now we've introduced class two leverage. What happens when you clench and grind on class two leverage? Cusps fracture off. So suddenly all hell is let loose and we get increased amounts of wear on the front teeth, back teeth where cusps start to shatter. Why? Because it's now class two leverage. What's the goal of our occlusal therapy? I said it to you earlier. Keep on going back to class three leverage. See class two leverage, eliminate it, go back to class three. Okay, guidance. Final principle, posterior stability. I want to create good stability at the back of the mouth. And for that, it means three contacts, tripodized contacts, wherever possible at the back of the mouth. And the other thing I want is cusp to fossa relationships, not cusps hitting onto marginal ridges. So that's 10, 15 minutes on occlusion. OK, six days I need to teach it to you fully. So let's go back to our patient. We know what we're going to be doing. We've done a little bit of cosmetic imaging on him. Uh, remember, create space established a reorganized occlusion. We're going to create space by prepping the anterior teeth five to five, not prepping palatally, only prepping a little bit off the occlusal surface of the fours and fives, putting prototypes on which look good, which are high, allow the posteriors to overrut. So we're increasing vertical dimension and therefore taking him back. Remember, these are the anterior teeth. 
Okay, increased vertical dimension, our anterior teeth drift back like this because we're on a hinge. That allows us the ability to make our front teeth longer. So we start off diagnostic waxing, mounted study cast around RAP, classic diagnostic waxing, get our prototypes made, make sure they look right, make sure they're the right shapes. Look at the occlusal plane. We've come down deliberately. There's our occlusal plane because we've made these longer than they would be normally. We prep the teeth. We don't prep anything off the palatal aspects other than a finish line, keeping all that palatal enamel a little bit off the occlusals, but not too much. We put our prototypes on. We establish a class one occlusal scheme at an increased vertical dimension. We've given the patient correct overbite and overjet. He's got guidance, nice and shallow guidance, but it disglues the posteriors. And we now wait. We wait for the lips to come back. We wait for the upper molars to over erupt. Okay, and this is what's happening now. At the end of three months, look at his lips. Beautiful, his lips are now relaxed. End of three months, lips relaxed, back teeth in contact. Let's go and nicely restore him now. So this becomes a nice standard case. And we do this in whatever material you want to. I think this is um, Emacs, which I've been using here. And we bond the restorations in place. And we've got some nice looking even restorations back to a class one occlusal scheme, opened up his vertical dimension. He looks a little bit better. Uh, molars are in contact, but remember, I'm always going to protect. So I'm always going to put the splint in there for protection, just in case my patient, the odd time, doesn't wear it, forgets it, breaks it. Okay, I want to have my splint there in case the patient, again, forgets to wear it or hell may look, let loose. So I want something protecting it at night time. And there's my final case. So a nice case, which is giving us a combination of tooth preparation, okay, minimizing it, but still heavy. Nobody's getting around it. These are crown preps, but I'm minimizing the amount of tooth destruction, doll appliances, occlusion principles, creating space. Let's look at the next one. Next one, full mouth reconstruction. We're going to go to full mouths now, increased vertical. Um, we look at this case. So we've got a lot of wear taking place, a lot of missing teeth. Look at the lower incisors. This is a case I was talking to you a little bit earlier where the lower incisors have all over erupted. They've over erupted because this is his retreated contact position and he slips into a class three. Okay. So you look at the side teeth in retreated contact and this is a class one occlusion. So he's basically posturing forwards because of his retreated contact position. Okay, so I'm going to restore him now at an increased vertical, but that means his lower anterior teeth are still going to be a little bit high. So I'm going to go and flatten the lower anteriors, and that will give me a little bit more space to take the upper anteriors, that upper one, which is retroclined, and move it forwards into an ideal class one occlusion. Uh, so here's my occlusal view. I'm going to do some bridge design here. Um, we're using Durelay bonnets, coat hanger wire pickup techniques, classic prosthodontic techniques. Um, I've ground down those lower anteriors, uh, not into denting, but so that they look nicer and it's given me a little bit more space. Do my pickup impressions, make my prototypes, and then my final end result. And again, a class one occlusal scheme fully protected, okay, five principles of occlusion, right lateral, canine guided, everything comes apart, class three leverage, left lateral, canine guided, everything comes apart, class three leverage, anterior in protrusion, everything comes apart, class three leverage, five principles, condals in the right position, muscles relaxed, okay, predictability is the key. Right, final case, guys. Um, we've been at it an hour and a half now. So this final case is probably going to take us half an hour to finish. But what I want to do is go through in detail, okay, the planning, not the execution, but the planning of this case and why we do it in a particular way. So the first thing we need to think about is if we're going to increase vertical dimension, as we've discussed in several of these cases, how do we increase it? What do we increase it by? How much? 
whereabouts do we increase it? What vertical should I work at? So I have four verticals which I can work at, okay? First one is the existing vertical. And if I'm gonna do a large restorative case, this is a wear case, okay? The whole treatment options for the wear case. So a wear case working at the existing vertical does not make sense. The reason being, if it's a wear case, then the teeth have already been ground down a lot. Really, do you want to go and grind down another two millimeters on the lower anteriors, for instance, just so you can put two millimeters of composite back again? So that does not sound a really good way of creating space for your restorations. Large full mouth case, we therefore work at an increased vertical. So I'm not saying I would never, never say never, but I can't think of a reason why I would work at the existing vertical dimension. It's probably one out there I can't think. So 99% of the time, let's say we don't do it. So we work now at an increased vertical dimension. So next question for you is, what is that increase? How do I know? How do I know how much tooth tissue has been lost? How do I know what is what is original, a vertical dimension, to be? And the answer is, we don't. We have to take a guess. So we have three different verticals that I can work at. And I put these down as the minimum prep, the RCP, and the facial aesthetics. Let's look at the minimum prep. Okay, so number one, mount your models on the articulator around RAP. Okay, next thing is, do you have enough space around RAP to go and now restore? Because remember, if we mount around RAP, there'll be a retreating contact position. The case I showed you earlier, there's loads of space between the anterior teeth when I took the patient back to RCP, okay? So in a case like that, I could work around RCP because I've got space now. So as long as I work around RCP, my technician could do an additive wax up everywhere else and we build them into contact, okay? The other one is if I don't have enough space around RAP, so I only have a miniature smile, uh, slide, half a millimeter, quarter of a millimeter, okay? Now we open up the vertical more until we have less tooth preparation to do. So let's look at this. Um, minimum tooth preparation or, or the, uh, if I don't want to do any tooth preparation on the lower incisor, okay? Minimum amount of porcelain ceramic composite, I need about two millimeters. So if I open up two millimeters and work at a two millimeter increased vertical, that means that I don't have to do any um, destruction on the incisal edge or palatal aspects of my uppers. So that means it's just an axial preparation. But remember, if I open up by two millimeters at the front, how much does that mean at the back? That's two thirds of a millimeter, okay? If I'm doing a PFM at the back, I need 1.5 millimeters. If I'm doing an upper and a lower, I need three millimeters. Therefore, what would I have to open up at the front to get three millimeters on my second molars? I'd have to open up by nine millimeters. Now, that's usually far too much. So when we talk about opening up for the minimal prep, we're talking you and your technician getting together with the mounted study cast, opening up the vertical, as long as around RAP, open up vertical, have to be working around RAP. Rule, you cannot open up the vertical around ICP. Because when you open up vertical, you've got no ICP left. So we have to open up around RAP. So... Models in uh, retreated axis position, open the vertical up so that you get a good compromise between length of lower anteriors, amount of space you've got at the back. So you minimize the amount of tooth prep. So this is by an arbitrary amount dictated with your thought process being, let's try to minimize the amount of tooth prep that I do. Final one, the one I'm gonna talk about here is facial aesthetics. So let's go through this. Let's meet Iva, okay? So uh, first of all, look at Iva. Tell me what you think of him. He's got greasy skin. His hair's not very good. Um, he's got many chins. He's fat in the lower third of the face. Nose, chin distance, overclose. You would, you'll, you, you know what his teeth look like. We're going to show you his teeth in just a second. You know what they look like. They're worn down. Iva's lost vertical dimension. So we're gonna increase his vertical dimension, okay? 
but we're going to do it to facial aesthetics. So vertical dimension, what do we know about it? It's a dynamic concept and it gives me the opportunity of improving facial beauty. So when we have a large restorative case that involves wear, I will most of the time, 99% of the time, increase vertical dimension, give my patient a nice looking smile, whatever he wants. That can be a media smile, BL1. It can be a crooked, nice, aggressive, natural smile. But I'll increase vertical dimension so we get better facial proportions. And what I'm looking to do is try to take five to 10 years off his face by increasing vertical dimension. Okay, called the dental facelift. And in order to do that, one of the most important parts that we have to plan for now are occlusal planes. We need to make sure that we get the occlusal planes in the right position. We're going to spend some time on that. So let's look at facial proportions. We all know from aesthetics, we've done so much on smile design. Two words, two huge words on smile design, on aesthetics are proportion and symmetry. Symmetry across the midline. So right and left look the same or similar. And the other part is proportion. We know about golden proportion. But let's look at facial proportion. We know from our beautiful people that the hairline to bridge of nose, bridge of nose to base of nose, base of nose to chin should be equal thirds. Okay. So what we're going to do with Ivor is look and see what's happening with the lower third of his face. Another one is we can use golden proportion. So we're going to look at Ivor and we're going to see if we can increase vertical dimension. Okay. If we do, then look what happens. Okay. Again, a study in the BDJ, we've increased vertical dimension on patients, 81% of a panel, four out of five people looking at him says he looks younger. So who doesn't want to look younger in this day and age? And to increase by five millimeters seems to be the amount that we need in order to get other people to look and see there's a physical change. Those other people aren't going to go, oh, great vertical dimension you're working at. Love it. Love your new vertical dimension. No, those people are going to say, you look younger. You look better. Have you been away? Uh, have you lost weight? Have you been on a diet? You've been to a health farm. There's something different about you. They won't notice that it's a vertical dimension. They'll just see you look better. You look younger. You look healthier. If we do increase vertical dimension, some people always have this worry about invading um, freeway space. Please don't worry about it. We've got this lovely thing called proprioception, which means that if we invade freeway space, as long as you do it the right way, remember, around RAP, we invade freeway space, the first time that our teeth now contact together, proprioception goes centrally, the mandible, the muscles, tells the muscles, this is the new position of your teeth. Therefore, drop back by two, three, four millimeters, create a new freeway space. Happens 100% of the time, as long as you're working around REP. Doesn't happen, incidentally, in denture patients. And that's one of the problems we have. By increasing patients' um, vertical dimension on full, full dentures, because there's no proprioception, you know yourself what the patients say. I can't talk properly. I can't eat properly. It feels like I've got a mouth full of teeth. Okay? Because they've not got the proprioception telling them. So don't worry about that. So let's go back to either. Okay, number one, we're going to increase his vertical. How much are we going to increase it by? And then number one, we need to let that be tested. So let's measure. We're going to measure either from hairline, bridge of nose, bridge of nose, base of nose, base of nose, chin. Okay? We can't do anything about the top two, but we can do something about the lower third. And I want to make the lower third either equal to the middle third or equal to the top third. Okay? Whichever is going to be the greater. I want to put him at least until that lower third is at least the same as the middle third, or if not, the upper third. So we get this facial stretching, this elongation of the face, this so we measure it, simple measure it. Do some measurements, 
Okay, get your dividers on, do some measurements, decide what it should be, how much it should be open by, put it into a copy, put it into a U shape, put it onto the top tick, make sure it's not impinging on the lips, lay your patient down by manual manipulation, get the lower teeth to actually just dig into the wax, not all the way through, take the wax out put it into some iced water so it now goes rock hard. Patient sat up. Now we put the wax in place. Again, get the patient to close into the indentations and now we measure. And let's just say that the middle third is 45 and the lower third is 40. And we want to increase this lower third by five millimeters. We put the wax in and it's 50. Okay, well too open. What do we do? We say, okay, either squeeze, squeeze, stop, Okay, it's 47. Squeeze, squeeze, stop. 46. Squeeze again, stop. 45. It's now the right amount. Now we show either. And you all know yourselves. Um, whether it's ladies I'm lecturing to, men. Um, I say ladies probably a little bit more. Uh, you've gone to the hairdresser. You've had a new hairstyle done. Maybe you've changed color. You've gone from long hair to short hair to a bob. You look at yourself in the mirror. What's the first thing you see? You see somebody who's not you. This is not you. And the first thing you see and think about express is doubt. You go, oh, dear. Oh, I'm not sure. Oh, have I done the right thing? Okay. So two things. Number one, have somebody with you. So Ivor comes in with um, his girlfriend, his wife, or, or whatever, um, to give them their opinion. That's number one. Number two, let Ivor take the wax away with him for a period of time at home. Okay, ladies, we've had the haircut done. We go home. What are you doing as you go home? Every shop window you're going past, you're going, looking in the shop window, getting used to this. And guess what happens? The longer you get used to it, the more you come to terms with it. And it really helps when some of your friends say, great, oh, I love the new look. It looks fantastic. So don't expect either when he now brings his lips together to look at his new face and go, love it. His first thought is, that's not me. So give him some time. So we bring Ivor back one week later. Okay. And we now say, okay, what do you think? And he's been trying it in and he might say, absolutely fine. Or Paul, it's just not me. In which case, okay, squeeze a bit more, squeeze a bit more. And instead of it was 40, it may be that we stop at 42 or 43. We've still increased it but not the five millimeters that we need to make everybody see that this is a new idea. Remember, five millimeters is the minimum we need for other people to see it. So anyway, we've now got our new vertical that we're going to work at. And of course, that will go to our technician and he will mount the models at that with that wax, drop the incisal pin down, and that's now the vertical dimension we're going to be working at. Okay, so we found it, he's experienced it, so we're ready to go. These are his teeth, okay, as you can see, pretty well worn down. Uh, we've got over erupted teeth at the back, we've got missing teeth. So this is a full mouth reconstruction. Uh, we've mounted our study casts. Now remember, we've got to start thinking about these occlusal planes, okay? Hugely important. What does the occlusal plane do? Well, first of all, let's look at one thing. I want smooth, flattish occlusal planes. I do not want steps in my occlusal plane. Why? Steps in the occlusal plane mean that a tooth is over erupted or under erupted, and maybe some of the other teeth are over erupted. And it means my guidance now has to be steeper to overcome the over erupted tooth. What I want in my reconstruction, as well as my five principles, I want my guidance to be shallow. Remember, the guidance there is where my patient's going to be bruxing. Now, for instance, let's look at a canine. Okay, palatal surface of a canine. And I've got two options here. I can either make the palatal surface steep like this, or I can make it shallow like that. What's going to be the best? Okay, let's say if I make it steep. My patient's now bruxing. So my jaw, my lower canine, wants to move horizontally to the left. 
As he's doing that, he's hitting a near vertical wall. So it will be coming downwards because this is a steep plane. But as he's doing this, there's an awful lot of stress that's now being placed in the masticatory system. The teeth are wearing, there's a lot of stress. One of those teeth could fracture. The stress in the muscles, the stress in the joints. Now what happens if I take that steep canine, what happens if I make it very shallow? Patient now does that. So when he bruxes, all the force of the bruxing has been dissipated because it's a nice, easy movement to make. So the masticatory system loves shallow guidance. I love shallow guidance. Shallow guidance works and it's, again, class three leverage, but it's a nice flowing movement. Imagine the ice skater sliding around on the ice, no stress whatsoever. That's shallow guidance. Flat, smooth occlusal planes, no teeth up or down the occlusal planes, allows me to put shallow guidance in place. So, number one, I want shallow guidance. I want even smoother occlusal planes. Uh, it also gives me the aesthetics. It gives me the amount of tooth reduction and any need for crown lengthening if I do have over erupted teeth. So let's start to work out what my occlusal plane should be. How am I going to do it? Right. Questions for you again. What occlusal planes do you know of? Maybe a bit of a strange question. Okay. But we have got certain occlusal planes that we work to in the mouth. Those are called the curve of Spey, curve of Wilson. Those are occlusal planes. Those affect the shapes of our teeth. So anterior posterior curve of Spey, buccal lingual curve of Wilson. Those are two occlusal planes. So a question for you again. When you're doing a full, full denture, okay, full upper, full lower denture, do you do the lower bite block first? So we've done first inch, we've done second inch. Do we do the lower back block first or the upper back block first? Think about it. One's right, one's wrong. Answer. Always the lower back block first. When we do a diagnostic waxing, it's always the lower waxing first. Why? Well, we want to get now as close as possible to the ideal occlusal plane to the patient's natural occlusal plane, to the anatomical average occlusal plane. We've got those three things, okay? In the dentalist patient, there's no teeth there. So how do we know where those occlusal planes were? Aha, we know because our science and papers tell us that the curve of spay not only goes to the canine custard, buccal custard for the four, five, sixes, sevens, eights maybe, but it goes through the superior third of the retromolar pads. So even if we have no teeth, or all the teeth are worn down to stumps, okay, we know that the correct occlusal plane, correct curve of spay, goes through the retromolar pads. We don't have anything in the upper jaw. The only thing we have is in the lower jaw. So let's make use of that. So remember, for a plane, how many reference points do I need? Three. Okay, two posterior, one anterior, two anterior, one posterior. Okay, it doesn't matter. I need three points for a plane. So I've already got my two points in the lower jaw. Irrespective of what the teeth look like, I know that my curve of spay, my posterior occlusal plane goes through the superior third. So now all I want is my anterior one. Okay, so what are we going to do for the anterior one? Anterior one, we're going to go to the M position, M, and how much incisal edge we show with our lips at rest. And again, all the dental prosthetic books we've got there, the full, full denture books, we've got lovely tables, mentioned it earlier. What happens to our face, our muscles? We lose the elasticity and our muscles drop. So a young teenager, when she goes M, Shows all upper tooth, no lower tooth. A 60-year-old dentist, haggard dentist, ex-professional cricketer like myself, when he goes Emma, no upper tooth, all lower tooth. Okay, so something's changed between teenager and 60-year-old dentist. And that's the elastic component. Happens to us all. 
So what we need to do now is understand Ivor, how old is Ivor? Ivor's 55 years of age. Question to Ivor. Ivor, do you want your teeth to look 55? Do you want your face to look 55? Or at the end of it, would you like your teeth, your smile, and your face to look maybe five to ten years younger? What do you think I, I was going to say? I was going to say, yes, please. So we can go and see where our incisal edge position should be for a 55-year-old, but actually I want it to be for a 45-year-old because I'm going to be setting my lovely smile for a 45-year-old person. So whereabouts is it going to be? Okay, For a 45-year-old person, then we're looking at around about 1.5 millimeters above the lower lip. So that's going to be my third reference point. So two posterior reference points already there on the study cast. Okay, how am I going to get the third one? I've got two posteriors. How am I going to get my third one? Easy. This is either. This is the M position. Guess what? Again, we don't see teeth there. So we know or we got a good idea that we've lost vertical dimension. So I'm going to now take a perio probe. I'm going to probe behind Ivor's lips as best I can. Okay, Ivor, Emma, stay like that. I'm going to probe behind the lips, and I'm going to find out where lower, it doesn't matter if it's left or right, I'm going to choose left, left, lower left central incisor is. So I'm probing behind with a perio probe. So I'm going to probe down to find out where lower left central incisor is. And let us just suggest, in Ivor's case, it's two millimeters below the lower lip. So I'm now going to say to my technician, okay, Mr. Technician, please, when you've got that study cast here, what I want you to do is to take that lower left central incisor and I want you to wax up two millimeters onto it, takes it to the lip level, and then an extra one and a half. So I want you to wax up just one tooth for now, nothing else, one tooth, that lower left central incisor, wax it up so it's 3.5 millimeters taller. And that now gives me my third reference point. I've now got my plane. Now I'm going to go to my mounted study cast. Okay, we've got the five millimeters of vertical opening, roughly whatever it was with um, Iber. So we've mounted the models at this increased vertical dimension. I'm now going to do a little bit of treatment planning myself. So this is for me. So I put a little elastic band, a little rubber band around the articulator. And obviously I can move the rubber band up and down, which will take this posterior and anterior rubber band position. And make a difference. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this up and down until as I'm looking from the side, this view, the rubber band is passing about three and a half millimeters over upper left central incisor. I'm also going to take the rubber band at the back, move it up and down. So looking at the side, the rubber band is going through the superior third of the retromolar pad. Guess what? This is now what my new occlusal plane is going to look like. Hold on. I need curvature to it. So it's not going to be exactly like this. This is my flat representation of a curved occlusal plane. Remember, curve of space, curve of Wilson. I'm going to introduce the curvature in a little bit of time. I'll show you how. But initially, that shows me what it's like. Next thing I'm going to do is put a pencil mark there. So replace the um, rubber band with the pencil mark okay this is treatment planning what do i see patients missing posterior teeth teeth above over erupted patient missing posterior teeth tooth above over erupted so straight away from a treatment planning point of view i'm thinking to myself i'm thinking to either i'm looking at radiographs am i going to take those teeth out replace my implants do i have a low sinus in which case maybe i'm going to do a sinus graft and put implants in or am I going to do crown lengthening, root fillings, etc.? cetera? Um, his teeth here already root filled. So I'm being pushed towards, let's do some crown lengthening. Let's do some root filled. Uh, let's replace the root fillings or work with the cores so we can get these teeth looking a little bit further up. Next stage, I'm going to grind those upper teeth out of the way so I've got space to do my lower waxing. Now, hugely important piece of kit, okay? Boyle's Plane Analyzer. You get one of these from um, your lab technician. Mostly, 
Uh, Crown and Bridge guys don't have them. These are denture prosthetic technicians. They have them. Okay. If you can't find one, email me. Okay. Our laboratory that I use in Sheffield, Gary Jenkinson at Art, A-R-T, Art Laboratory in Sheffield. Um, he makes them. He makes them for, for other laboratories, etc. So this is a Boyle's plane analyzer. What is it? It's a piece of plastic that's curved. And it's a piece of plastic that has the anatomical average curve of Wilson, anatomical average curve of Spade already in it. So what am I going to do? Remember, my technicians waxed up one tooth. I'm now going to take that Boyle's plane analyzer. I'm going to rest it on the superior third of my retromolar pads. I'm going to rest it on that one waxed up tooth. Okay. And now my technician is going to wax all of the undersurface. So all of the teeth, the lower teeth, to the undersurface of the Boyle's plane analyzer. Okay. And now my lower wax up has been completed. I've got my anatomical curve of Spain going through where it wants to at the back, where it should do at the back. It's an ana average curve of Spain. And my anterior reference point aesthetically is in exactly the right position. The curve of Spay, the uh, average radius is between four to four and a half inches. Again, depends on what study uh, you use. But look, we've got a beautiful flattish, even occlusal plane. Flat occlusal planes, easy to disclude, shallow guidance. We protect our restorations, joints and muscles. Okay, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the top ones because my lower wax up completed. Okay, initially I'm doing a little bit of crown lengthening. I see my technician wax up to that level, not to this level, please. And then I'm going to go to the lip again, exactly the same uh, idea. Probe behind the upper lip. So a 45-year-old, when he goes, Emma, how much upper tooth should he show? It's about three quarters of a millimeter. So I'm going to go to the lip. And I'm going to find, I'm going to probe on upper right one, find that the upper right central is one millimeter short of the lip. I'm going to add on 0.75. So, Mr. Technician, please wax up upper central incisor 1.7 millimeters longer. Now wax up upper left central 1.7 millimeters longer. Now wax up the laterals so that they are about quarter to half an inch shorter. Now wax up the canine so they're the same length as the centrals. Now I've got my central incisor occlusal plane. Next thing to do is to wax up the palatal aspects. So the palatal aspects come down and actually contact the lower incisors. So I've now waxed up the palatal aspects. Next stage, wax up the upper posteriors, lower posteriors down. This is the hardest part of the case, guys. This is it. The case has now been completed. Okay, it's been completed in wax. That's the hard part. The easy part is taking that with preparation guides, with prototypes, and it's now carpentry, taking that and putting it into the mouth. So our prototypes are exactly the same in the mouth, working on the prototypes and then changing and copying them in the definitives. But this is my end result. Okay, my case is completed. My full mouth diagnostic wax up is done at the correct vertical with the correct occlusal planes with my five principles of occlusion. And that gives me predictable end results. Okay, and here's my predictable end result. Here's my nice smile. Okay, he went for something like a, a B1, so there's a bit of color in there. Uh, if you remember from the original. He only had half a, a tooth gap there, so we decided to just go and cross that one over a little bit. Uh, and there's the final end result, okay? And all we can see, and so this is my, my last clinical slide now. We're going to finish on this. I ask you the question, look at the difference between the two, okay? And I was never going to be a male model. We know that. But what we've done, we've given him teeth back, number one. So when he goes, Emma... He can see, everybody can see he's got teeth. Number two, we give him a nice smile. Okay, so this is a really, really nice smile. Right for his age, not too cosmetic, not ridiculously super white. Okay, but it's nice for his age. But also, look at the skin. Look at the skin pallor. Look at the eyes. 
Look at the lower third of the face. He looks healthier. He looks better. He looks five years younger. Maybe could squash it to 10 years. Okay. Does he look as though he's had a facelift? No. He looks as though he's been on holiday. He's lost some weight. He's been to a health farm. He just looks healthier. And that's my take home message, guys. My take home message is very much that if you can understand vertical dimension, if you can understand five principles of occlusion, then you can go and do beautiful full mouth reconstructions, partial reconstructions, make your patients so they have beautiful smiles, make them so they have younger appearances. But the huge point at the end of it is know your occlusion and you get predictable success rates. They work. It works. It works. It works. It works. It works. Nobody's going to tell you that we never have failures. But the whole point of doing this is minimize your failures, maximize your successes, help you sleep at night. More patients want to come and get you to do the treatments because they look better. They last longer. They don't have people rushing back with temperatures coming off or with fractures of their veneers or crowns. So thank you very much for uh, listening. Um, just a quick plug for Tipton Training and the British Academy, guys. Uh, we have been running webinars um, all throughout this lockdown period, completely, again, free of charge to the um, dental profession worldwide. Please go and visit www.tiptontraining.co.uk and you will be able to register free of charge uh, for those um, webinars. Uh, if it's been of interest, then please contact me at Tipton Training uh, or at Bard or my personal email, drpaultipton at gmail.com. Uh, and I'm here now to answer any further questions. So I hope you found that useful. I'm going to stop sharing and we can then hopefully come back to our previous screen. So let's go back and hopefully there we go. Okay, over to you. That's my two hours done. What an amazing lecture, my God. Uh, thank you so, so much. We have learned so much from you here in this, uh, in this uh, short period of time. Thank you. Um, so uh, just a couple of questions. How long do you uh, temporize them for before you do your anterior guidance and then your posteriors? Um, I like to do it. If, if I can, do. I like to take my time. Like you ask any prosthodontist, there's no rush. Take your time. We only, when we rush, things don't go right. So minimum time is two weeks, um, which is rushing. Maximum time is three months. After three months, my tissue is getting a bit soggy. So most of the time it's in between there, four to six weeks. Have you ever had a, a, a scenario where you temporized them, you raised the vertical, and then they came back and uh, explained that you have um, neck pain or side pain or something like that sort? No. No. I the only time, and, and people ask, it's a great question to ask. So I don't want to be blase about that. Um, it's a great question because people say a lot of the time, do you test the vertical dimension, the new vertical? Do you test it first of all in any way? Uh, and the answer is, yes, we do. We test it for two, four, six weeks, etc. And I make sure that they're comfortable, that the occlusion side to side is easy. They're not complaining that they feel stressed that they can talk uh, and they like the looks. But basically that is giving comfort to the patient. I am totally happy myself to go two weeks later and go and put the final restorations on, okay? And the reason is that there's one caveat to that. The caveat is, does the patient have active TMD? If the patient has active TMD, we treat the TMD first of all, and then we do our reconstruction. Just like active occlusal disease, treat the occlusal disease, do the reconstruction. So we treat first of all. So if somebody has got active TMD, they're complaining of muscle pains, they've got clicking joints, they've got headaches, neck aches, then we'll go through occlusal splint therapy first of all. And that for me is the usual way. You know, I'm not going to say we get 100% success. No, 85%-ish, some people need to go and have some surgery done. Some people need to wear the occlusal spent for up to two years. Uh, depends on, on what their position has been 
before they're coming to see me for treatment, but usually we treat. I wouldn't dream of going to restorative work until we have the patients comfortable. So when we have the patient comfortable and the patient's been treated with an occlusal splint, remember what the occlusal splint does here. The occlusal splint is giving five principles of occlusion, which is what I've been talking about, and it's at an increased vertical dimension. Okay, think about the occlusal splint. Typical Michigan splint, um, the way our technicians make Michigan splints is that uh, mounted around RAP, then the occlusal pin is opened until the thinnest part of the splint is two millimeters over the retruded contact position. So if the retreated contact position is in a six, for instance, my splint is two millimeters thick over the six, which means it's six millimeters thick at the front, that three to one. So now my patients have the vertical dimension increased by six millimeters at the front on a piece of plastic with five principles. And guess what? All I'm going to do is transfer exactly that same thing to composite prototypes and then to my definitives. So... If the question is, have I ever had somebody come back? Yes, I have. Okay. And the answer is, I've not done my job properly. I've made a mistake or missed a step out. So if right. I do my job properly, I'm comfortable my patients won't come back with those sorts of problems. Excellent. Uh, what about headaches, Doc? Um, have you, you encounter a lot of that throughout the treatment to increase the vertical? No, again, it's treat with occlusal splint therapy, first of all. If you've got headaches, muscle aches, go and treat those first of all before we take a burr. Once the occlusal splint's done its job, okay, everything's working fine, then the next stage is usually occlusal adjustment. And I try to make sure that's not equilibration for me. That is occlusal adjustment. I get rid of the gross problems and allow the, the everything else to adapt. I'm not into fine tuning down to a micron here or a micron there, get rid of the gross interferences. Then if my patient's still comfortable, I now go to restorations. Wow, excellent. Well, Dr. Tipton, uh, this was uh, an amazing, amazing lecture again. And we really are thank you, uh, thankful for you taking right. time and contributing uh, to this project. Um, thank you for the invitation and also for all the great work you're doing to get I don't know how many it is, 50, 100, however many it is, dentists to come on and give free webinars at this stage is great thanks to you. Uh, we're doing them back at, in the UK. Not as many people are listening to us, uh, but I know the amount of effort and work involved, and I've got four members of staff more or less just doing this all the time for no gain from ourselves. We're not getting anything from it whatsoever. All we're doing is I'm keeping my staff not oh, I'm keeping my staff working so I can still pay them without having to lay them off. So I'm doing it for my staff, for the profession. You're doing it on a much bigger scale. I understand the amount of work involved. Thank you for doing that as well. Huge, huge plus for you. Thank you. We all try to contribute in this peer-to-peer -peer platform. It's a new concept, new idea. But know that uh, the information that you have just uh, revealed to our colleagues there's uh, uh, tens of thousands of doctors that are going to benefit from it and uh, be able to get better care for their patients. So something to be very proud of. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Tipton. I wish Thank you a wonderful Saturday. Take care. Thank you. Take care.